Welcome back to another Dawn of the Data Age lecture. We're reporting here from beautiful Utah in the heart of the Silicon Slopes. Today's lecture is going to cover sales hacks with market research. And really, I hope that by the end of this, I have redeemed the name of market research. I'm going to get into this pretty quickly about perceptions related to this. But this is not a topic that unfortunately gets m many people excited, and yet it is an incredibly powerful tool that's not very hard to do. And it's a huge differentiator because very, very few other people are doing it. By the end of this lecture, you should have a good sense of what's available to you and possibly how to get started. For those who are joining for the first time online, we also have people here in the room. I'm Luciano. I'm the founder and CEO of Imperitas. We're economists and data scientists that focus on customer lifetime value for our clients. I'm also the founder and director of the Utah Community Research Group at the University of Utah, where I teach a range of economics-focused courses. A lot of them are around data science and applied research. So when I bring my expertise to bear today, it's going to be in both of these domains, both professionally as I practice it here at Imperitas and as I teach it at multiple universities. <coughs> as with our other lectures in this series, there are three parts to today. I'm going to talk about the power of market research specifically for sales. I'm going to then explain secondary and qualitative methods, and I will at that point address why I'm not encouraging you to do quantitative methods. I don't actually think that sales teams need to be doing very much quantitative research. I think most of the quantitative data that a sales team should look at comes from observational things that have been captured already. So this is stuff that's in a CRM. That's where, if you want quantitative data, that's the place to go looking for it. Qualitative information, however, is the most valuable to sales teams. Because you're already doing a lot of it, you're just not recording it. You're already having conversations with people. You're already nurturing people by email, by phone, in person, over coffee. The, the issue is that that data is not getting recorded, and if it were, you would be able to very quickly start to optimize a lot of your processes. And then we'll end with behavioral data. I'm an economist. Behavioral economics is really what drew me to, I didn't know what it was at the time, but the idea of understanding how people behave, what's motivating them. That was very interesting to me. There's a whole field within economics where this is studied. I'm going to go into some of those examples, and I'm going to talk about how you as a salesperson, this will be a major differentiator for you if you can start to incorporate behavioral data. And it really just means watching for body language. You're already doing these things by phone or in person. Start to record and observe for specific types of behavioral data, and you will see that it will help improve conversions. As I go through this, if you have a question, throw it up in the chat window, or you can unmute yourselves. We prefer to answer questions as we go, but there will be some time at the end today for this. So making the case for market research. Market research is boring. When you talk to people about surveys, they think about small pieces of paper on a table in a restaurant. It's not anything that's very uh, data science-y. It's just sort of boring stuff. And it couldn't be more wrong. That perception is so wrong. And I think this is largely because of the way that this material has been taught, but more specifically because it grew up as a outshoot of the marketing industry. So it was, in fact, if you go to the Market Research Association, the book that they will use for members to become certified is called Marketing Research by a man named Malhotra. And that's because most of these methods were pioneered by this giant, growing sector of the economy over the last hundred years, which is marketing. And I think because of that connection, it has been done in ways that are very, very boring. Focus groups are boring. They're not very effective compared to interviews. Everything I'm going to talk about today is interviews. There are times to do a focus group, but interviews are by far the better qualitative method. They're faster. You can get better information. They don't cost nearly as much, but they're still conversations. And conversations can be boring if you don't know what you're after. Surveys can be very boring, especially by phone. It wasn't until the rise of the internet that you started to get really engaging surveys. And so this perception that market research is boring is wrong, and it stops people from using it, and that's the real tragedy because this is literally an, an applied environment for you to experiment in. 
you can create the structure of those conversations. You can create a quantitative survey. And when you do that, you know what kind of data you're going to get. You know what you're probing for. This is a powerful, powerful environment. So it doesn't have to be boring, and it can have immense power. And the reason that it's powerful is because this is information that you don't otherwise have. So maybe you're part of a SaaS organization, or maybe you have some sort of digital product. Or even if you don't have a digital product, maybe you have really good tracking set up for physical products. You know where everything is and what's being sold, and you've got all this incredible data about your specific component of the market. We're going to talk about, when we get to the behavioral stuff, we're going to talk about the circular flow of the market and economics. You're, whatever it is that you're doing, it's a tiny little part. You have a SaaS product, now you might have more data than somebody else, but that's all proprietary information. Nobody else can get it. There's a huge amount of other information that's out there that you can get from a secondary research standpoint or from this qualitative research that might be publicly available or might be something you still only have access to. And there's no other way to get it except to get out of the building and go look for it. And so all of this information can be grouped into two types, public or proprietary. And we're going to talk about those now in order. So public information is what's out there in the domain. It's Google. It's government data sets. If you don't know about data.gov, and here in the state of Utah, we have also a really great data exchange because our state is so business focused and they saw that there's a competitive advantage in data and made it public. There is data at the federal level, there is data at the state level, there is data at the municipal level. And most of it is open and available to you. And some of this information can be really powerful for sales. So what if you started to know every time that a lead was given to you, maybe by marketing or for some offline channel, that once you had this lead, you know their zip code and you know their average credit score from that zip code and you can just start to prioritize based on something like credit score. So if you're a mortgage company, that's really helpful. That's publicly available data. You can just match it up through zip code. There's a lot of stuff about census. There's a lot of stuff about uh, labor markets. There's a lot of stuff about consumer prices and confidence that you can start to include to prioritize your sales leads. And then there's academia, think tanks and journals. And these are really all the same groups of people, but they might be getting paid from the government. They're separate. They're they're intellectuals. They're not the news media and the public domain. But you can get information to all three of these levels. When we get to secondary research, I'll talk about really the power in social, and that obviously should be kind of pertinent on everybody's mind right now with all the Cambridge Analytica stuff going on. Twitter is even more open than Facebook. You can, you can get an API token and be scraping Twitter in 90 minutes from now. If that interests you, send me an email after this. I'll send you the code from R and Shiny that we have that we built. You put in your own API tokens. You can scrape 300 tweets per 15 minutes. You get all the user information. You can go look them up, reverse engineer who they are. It's all public. The other one that's been emerging that's interesting is Slack channels. We'll talk about those like I said, when we get to secondary research. But this public information, whether it's coming from the government or academia or public domain, people chatting, people putting out news stories, blogs, it's not information you're creating. You're just passively consuming it, and that's why it is the target for secondary research. But let's talk about the other data type as well. There's proprietary information. There's information that only you have. Now, you could go out and do a research study, and VentureBeat is a good example of a company that does this. Accenture is a good example of a company that does this. They go out and they do research themselves. And rather than sit on it and have that competitive advantage, they sell it to everybody else for a couple hundred dollars. $199, $299. Usually there's a squeeze page, a landing page that you hit online. You fill in your information, you pay. It takes you to something, you download a PDF. They're selling that information which makes it public. If they decided that they were gonna keep it for themselves or for, in your case, you're gonna go out and talk to your customers or maybe your competitors' customers, you're not gonna share that information with anybody. This is becoming proprietary information. All that events data in your SaaS product that I talked about, that is proprietary information. All the stuff in your CRM, that's proprietary information. Nobody else has it. 
So unless you choose to sell it and make it public, it's yours. This is the differentiator right now. This is what's allowed Amazon to emerge as the dominant force. Jeff Bezos is now the richest person in the world. They have so much proprietary data that no one else can get. They are able to see the world in a way that no one else can. That's their power. Now, qualitative research that I'm going to outline from this point forward, like I said at the beginning, this is what sales teams should be doing. In fact, the more... I'm a very quantitative person. I'm a data scientist and an economist by training. I, I love quantitative data. But I have to say that as time goes on, I am becoming more and more convinced that qualitative data is the way to go. It's fast, it's cheap, and it really does pick up on the big, the low-hanging fruit to use business jargon. If you hear the same thing in five interviews, that's, a, that's something you got to address. You don't have to go through the effort of a 2,000-person survey that takes five months to go through from the whole development and fielding and analysis standpoint. You can figure out some of those big problems in a month with qualitative research. And even if you want to do quantitative research, and I've said this many other times in this lecture series, qualitative research is where you should be starting. Now, whether you're going to do, decide to do secondary research as I lay it out or do qualitative interviews, you need a system. If you follow this link in the bottom left, this is a system that was laid out in another one of the lectures. It was for product managers. It, it would be trivial for you to replicate this in sales. The whole point is you need a system. You need a system of thing uh, to put the secondary sources. I'm going to actually show you one in another slide. You need a system of organizing your interviews and recording things and filing things. You're going to produce information that needs to be organized. If you're just a little bit systematized from the beginning, this is a very smooth and easy process. If you're not, then it can be very difficult. But any system, no matter how flawed, is better than no system at all. So let's talk about both secondary and qualitative methods because this is what, as sales individuals, you should be focused on. Secondary research is based on that mountain of available public information. There's never been a time in history where this much information was this readily available to the average person in the world. It is an amazing time to be alive. And if you are systematized, you can cut through this to find incredible information about individuals, so for your qualification. Uh, you can, from a form that they might fill out for marketing and they pass it off to you in the CRM and you've got something like their name and their email and their phone number and maybe even their zip code, a Google search will probably uncover a huge amount of information on that individual. Could be in their domains of social, could be in blogs, could be in YouTube videos, could be um, could, I, resumes. You find people's resumes, you've got their address because everybody lists their address on the resume. They put a PDF online. And it's visible. Google's a great place. There's other, other sources you should be looking through beyond that. Um, academic journals are a good place to start. News stories is another. But as you're looking through this mountain of information, you've got to narrow down on your focus or, or you'll get lost. And there are really four pieces, and I've hit on this many other places in this lecture series. Product, price, message, and channel. From an economic standpoint, if you're paying attention to those four things, you can optimize 80% of your organization. The rest is all you know, cost centers and accounting and things. But from a customer standpoint, if you understand their product preferences, their pricing sensitivity, their market messaging, marketing messaging, so what they'll engage with, and then the channel mix, where they'll engage with it, that information gives you pretty much everything you need, and it lets you sort your secondary research ahead of time. Be looking for customer chatter. I said I'd come back to this with Slack channels. You can often join Slack channels and be connected to hundreds of individuals that are exactly who you're trying to reach. Social is a little different. So LinkedIn's pretty locked down, but you can pay to reach people. Twitter's totally open. Facebook is closed if you don't want to go through a company called DataSift. But you can still scrape social, uh, public social media. You can go read chat forums. There's a lot of 
customer chatter that's happening out there that you can learn from that's just publicly available if you put in minimal time. And if you're a pretty good sleuth, sometimes you can even find similar research to what you're trying to do. Other studies, other people's PowerPoint presentations about what they found. It accelerates your knowledge. It saves you a lot of time to do this step first. But most of the value that you're going to get is from qualitative interviews. So if you want to understand this whole process, there's a link in the bottom left. It will take you, if you jump to that video at 9 minutes and 5 seconds, it will go through this process in a case study of exactly how to conduct these. I'm not going to cover that today. I'm going to make the case of how you could use them. If you want to know how to actually do it, there's a different video in this. It's not in this lecture series, but it's another video that we produced in Peritas. It's about lean product market fit. Customer conversations are explained in detail in that video. The point of these is that they're natural conversations. And I said earlier, this is it. you're already doing this. Most of your sales process is person-to-person -person interaction. You're already having these. You're just not storing the information and you're not necessarily approaching it in a systematized way to test things. And if you prepare topics and questions ahead of time, if you know, hey, at this meeting, in, in, our, in our sales process, this meeting has this purpose and it's this information we're going to get out of it. That's enough to get started. You might want to even go a step further and do real interviews that are built around real questions. If you follow that link, the double asterisk to the product manager conversion conversation script, that's a Google form. You can actually take that. It's a, a form. You can fill it out. You can see the whole thing. That's being used by our researchers when they conduct these conversations. They don't type the entire time, but it's a guide for them. Here's the main things we're going to cover. And they record the conversations, they type some notes as they go, then they come back, they transcribe it, they fill it in, and then all that data goes to a uh, sheet where we can then start to do some analysis on it. You can see that example, just follow that link. If you're going to do these in interviews, incentives matter. Sometimes you can get people to participate for free. If you want to basically guarantee participation, offer somebody $100. You'll get high-level people who would have otherwise ignored you. $100 Amazon gift card for 30 minutes of your time. But the solicitation of these interviews can take quite a while, and so in some cases you might want to use a third party, and I'll show you when that is or is not possible. Now, we have a question here in the room. So, um, phone interviews, in-person interviews. Phone versus in person. Pros, cons, is that what you're looking for? Uh, yeah. So when we started doing a lot of qualitative research, we were using all channels. We started by using all channels. We said, look, we will talk to you by Skype. We will talk to you by Google Hangout. We'll send you a Zoom meeting. We'll send you an Uber conference. We will meet you in person. We will call you. We will uh, come visit you physically. And given all those options, 99% of people said, just call me. So we just moved to where we do almost all of these by phone. If they're in some of these interviews, when I lay this out, because there's different kinds of interviews, it's not just going to be one type for sales teams. So because sales teams are going to depend so heavily on qualitative research, they're going to have a more robust research design related to the qualitative research. And that can be organized, if you look at this slide, it can be organized by the four stages of, and these are four of the five, there's others, some people have ten stages. I'm just giving you the basic points here about, at some point you've got to qualify leads, you've got to reach out to them, you've got to pitch them, and then you've got to nurture deals that you lose or even deals that you win, you might want to still nurture them and keep a relationship to keep them re-purchasing. So you can organize your interviews by those stages, but they're going to be different kinds of interviews. And in one case, the customizing the pitch, it's not even really an interview. You're observing the whole time. I'm going to make the case that you should have somebody else who comes to the meeting who watches everybody and writes down what they are doing physically the entire time. Because you will see where you had their attention. You will see where you lost them. You will see what proportion of the room was engaged. You will see... Uh, all kinds of information that helps you start to refine your pitch so that it has the highest probability of turning them into a customer, not a lost deal. But if they become a lost deal, there's different kinds of information you want to get from them. And in that case, you can't observe them and you can't even talk to them because they're going to just totally 
question your motives. So you have to use a third party in that situation. That's not true with lead qualification. In fact, you really should be doing it yourself unless you've got a really trustworthy partner to do it. So I think phone is sufficient if you're going to do something like the lead qualification or the outreach interviews or even the nurturing. You just wouldn't be the one doing it in the nurturing stage. But let, we'll go into each of these right now in detail. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So with qualification, this is a step that can't be outsourced unless you have a really, really qualified and reliable partner. And I know they exist. MarketStar here in Utah is one of these amazing outsourced sales organizations. Their clients absolutely love them. The results they produce are amazing. Um, you know, I would trust them. But if if you're thinking that you can just hand this off completely to some other group and they're going to handle it for you, you're wrong. This has to be guided still by your team because you know what the qualifications are to flag people. And the purpose of this is that you should be getting information that lets you predict at this early stage whether or not this deal will close and at what value. Now, these qualification interviews are probably actually phone calls. That's usually most sales teams, when we talk about their queue process, they're getting leads from marketing. And in their quali they're saying, okay, these are sales accepted leads. Now we're going to make them sales qualified leads. And we're going to start reaching out to them. And we call everybody. I hear that all the time. We call everybody. Well, that's, that's actually not a mistake so much as it is a misunderstanding of how you should approach this. It's fine to call everybody, but there are some people that you should be putting at the top of the list. And if you can start to predict that at this stage, you will have huge efficiency gains. <coughs> and that's, that's what the last lecture covered, and we've got a link for that coming up. These interviews, you can, if you're a good enough agency, you're a good enough company, you can usually charge for this. You don't have to do this even for free. Even though your team has to do it, it doesn't have to be for free. And so the power hour, I don't know if you've heard that term, Dennis Yu from Blitz Metrics, and the link is down there in the bottom left. I think he's the person who pioneered a power hour. My understanding from teaching at the university was that the power hour was a drinking game, and if you Wikipedia search it, that's what you're going to show. But this idea of the power hour in the business world is, instead of giving your time away for free, ask them to pay. It's a quick way to qualify whether or not this person's serious about solving their problem or not whether they have a clearly time-constrained need and a budget to go along with it. Those are the two pieces of information that I would immediately encourage you to start collecting about every qualification. But as you reach out by phone, you're going to talk to them. Know what you're going to ask so that you can start to predict with high probability that as this individual deal moves through the rest of the customer journey, it's going to eventually close and become a good customer that stays on for a long time. What about the outreach? So this can, be, this can be done really well through optimization around sales data. So if you've got a good CRM, it should be telling you what days and times at a minimum are the best to reach out to a lead to keep them moving through your funnel. There are predictable patterns there. And you've got a lot of software that should capture some of it. That's still not a substitute for going and talking to this customer type. This could be your customers. You could go do an interview with them and say, you know, tell me about the process of, of us selling you and how that was and the stages. It could be your competitors' customers that you're talking to. It could be nobody's customers yet that you grab from the market and you say, okay, you're looking for this kind of service or product. We offer it. Other people offer it. What would turn you into a customer? What's the process? How should we get a hold of you? What's the best time? When are you thinking about this kind of stuff? These interviews can be done by yourself or they can be done by a third party. This one, um, in some cases, can be improved by using a third party because this is the first place that as sales teams, they're going to start to suspect your motivations. They're going to be like, ah, this is just a roundabout sales tactic. And do not treat research like that. There's going to be a temptation because... You're talking to people who could buy your service. If you give in to that temptation and you then cross a line in the research world where you're basically, it's called push-pulling in political research, 
you're using research to get some outcome that's not really the research. That's not a good thing. But again, product price, message, and channel. Just like with the secondary research, whatever information you get from customers of whatever type, whether it's you or a third party, understand product preferences, understand price sensitivity, understand messaging preferences, and understand the channel mix that is going to allow you to reach them. Because they're predictable, they're humans. So to get back, Tom, to your question about the interviews in person by phone, the pitch is usually in person or it's still over some sort of conference where you might have video. I would encourage you to screen capture. People are so conditioned to not want to listen to themselves, to not want to watch themselves on video. And that's one of those fears that if you can just personally get over, it propels your career forward because other people don't want to do it. And you'll hear the ums and ahs and things that annoy you, and then you can fix them. Observing data or observational data is really powerful. And the pitch is a moment where you want this data to be collected. It is not possible often as the individual who is doing the pitch. If you're a salesperson who goes all the way through, you're not just bird dogging, but you're actually going through the entire process of closing the deal including presenting the solution to them. You still can't do it alone. You have to do this part yourself. If you're using a third party, someone like MarketStar, then get them to record it too. But your team has to be doing this because no one else is in the room for these pitches. You just observe. And you won't be able to do that as you actually present the solution. It's worth having someone else in the room who's got a notepad and who's watching. You know, you could be recording it, you could be recording the audio, but there's someone else who's watching the behavior. When do people come and leave on the conference call? When do people in the room start to pull out their phones or look at their devices? When did they get upset? When did they get elated? Who got elated? What's the relationship between all these people here? This is behavioral data. This is the beginning of the behavioral data, and this is the moment. This is the tipping point moment where a deal is won or lost. So all that stuff before about reaching out the cadence and messaging or qualification, it's still building up to predict this moment that you close the deal. You're not going to do it every single time, which means there's another stage afterwards, and this is nurture. And I actually would encourage you to think more along the agile methodology approaches and stop thinking about nurture as only for those who didn't close. Keeping a whole relationship going at a respectable level with current customers is just as important. They're expensive to replace. Churn is a big problem, especially if you're a SaaS company. You learn quickly how important churn, customer churn is. So even for the deals you do win, which will not be all of them, you should still be thinking about how to best nurture them. I've seen where there's not enough support and the client customer feels isolated and they leave because they don't understand the product, they don't know how to get started, or they don't feel a connection anymore to the company, to the provider. I've also seen the flip side where they get smothered in people who are just constantly wanting to talk to them, salespeople. And it's to the point where it interferes with their day-to-day -day job, and then they're not happy anymore. You've got to strike the balance between those, but even for deals you do win, nurture should be something you're focusing on. But the deals that you lose, you really want to understand why. And this is one of those pieces that has to be done by a third party. They will not tell you honestly, very rarely. You might get one or two people who, you know, that, and they will describe themselves all the time. as like, well, I just always tell the truth, and I don't care what people say. Right? Most people want to be nice over being honest. And so if you have lost a deal and they feel bad for you about it, they're not going to give you honest information. And they might question again, like earlier, well, your motivation here is to just understand how to keep selling me and I'm telling you already that we're gone. You want brutally honest information here. You've got to get it through a third party. These should be very short and very focused and probably have a really good incentive. And the incentive can't be, hey, come back to our restaurant or come back and buy our product. Because if they're not going to use you again, then that incentive won't motivate them to participate. 
It's got to be something that says, we know you have a valuable opinion on this problem. We want to, we want to understand it. We've hired a third party. That third party should encourage them to be as honest as possible. And you will know exactly why you actually lost these deals. And that's really helpful for customizing the pitch. And that's really helpful for understanding what kind of messaging and outreach to do. And that's really helpful for qualifying a lead at the very beginning of this process based on the likelihood that they're going to become one of your best customers. So how do you use behavioral data in this? I told you I'm an economist. I think economics is by far the best way to, the best set of lenses to look through the world with. And behavioral economics has come so far in the last 20, 30 years because of actual experimentation. So when I say this, it's often academics, so individuals who are teaching as a economist, but who are also conducting experimental research. There are a lot of famous cases about this in psychology from the 60s and 70s, but one of the things that has changed in the 80s, 90s, and then 2000s around this kind of research was both the rise of computers, which meant you could start to create representative agents, and then you could model, you could observe something in a room or do an experiment in the physical world, take the parameters that you observe, put them into these machines, and run all kinds of simulations to see what could happen in all these different possible scenarios. So that really accelerated this approach to understanding the world. And simulation is the next, so I, I will predict, I'll go on record right now, and I will say that after the big data wave fully dies, because there's that you know second uptick with AI, but eventually we'll just kind of slowly go back into the background and just be something that everybody does. The next thing, the next wave of jargon that's going to come out is going to be about um, simulation. Now taking information and figuring out what's likely to happen. The other reason that this approach started to accelerate in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s was because of game theory. So suddenly there was a really good reason for understanding these kind of estimates and this kind of behavior because you could put it into game theory models, not just any simulation, but a game theory simulation. And that would tell you with very high probability what your best next move might be. And that's really powerful. <clears throat> Most of what we're going to talk about in this section when it comes to behavioral economics is tied to the concept of signaling. So in economics, the idea of signaling is that you are showing people sort of who you are at all times with things like the way you talk, the way you dress, the colors you pick, the car you drive. They're nonverbal cues that tell other people how you expect to be interacted with. Ties. Yeah, ties. Socks in the business world is another one. Black. The colors are. Uh, if you look at a politician, you can spot them in a crowd, right? Because they're all going to have that little flag lapel pin. And if you don't, then you can't be a politician. That's the law, right? These are not usually codified in actual rules. They're just customs. And it drives most human interaction. In fact, most communication is this nonverbal stuff. This is why when you are observing the pitch or having someone else observe for you, you're looking for body language. Is because it is hugely expressive. And these approaches have been validated. There's a good link here. I would encourage you to go, uh, if you don't look at any of the other links, just trust me. Just go to this one, The Power of Being Watched. That little Google short link will take you to an academic paper. You can read the abstract. Download the, the full PDF if you want. There's so many of these experiments where they just would go in to create an office environment. And they'd have people actually work there for months and months and months. And they would uh, put up cameras or have people watching and observing. You know, how much time do people just sort of shirk is the term. They just kind of sit there and they don't do their work even though they're there at, at the job. They're looking at Facebook. They're watching YouTube. They're just daydreaming. They just disappear all of a sudden. They go outside for a smoke break. They're not working. But what about other things like how do you stop theft in the kitchen room? Well, it turns out that if you just put up a pair of eyes in the kitchen room, something that says, you know, you're basically being watched, people's behavior predictably changes drastically. And so that link talks about how you can encourage certain social behavior just by using eyes. Because it triggers something in people, they feel like they're being watched, and it changes the behavior predictably. Now, 
if you haven't had an econ class, and usually you can't get through college at this point without doing some sort of economics class, really what you're talking about are two groups. We're going to look at the interaction of two groups, and this is really, this is you. You're the front line on this interaction. You've got organizations, firms, businesses, companies, whatever you want to call them. That's one half of this, this circular flow of the economy. And then on the other side, you have the individuals, the customers. They're grouped into households. It could be a household of a single person, but they're grouped into households. And those households provide work to the firm in exchange for a wage. And then those wages are spent buying the products of the firm, and it goes round and round and round. This really does capture most of the actual economic activity that's observed, which means you, as a salesperson, can focus on two very simplistic things. The customers, there's different types. Your customers, competitors' customers, non-customers, meaning they'd never buy your product. It's good to understand them, too, because then you know how to just totally avoid them. Potential customers, lost customers, you can redefine these groups many different ways, but they're one half of this. The other are the companies. You're a part of it. Your competitors are another part of it, and then if you really want to get nuts, you can start to look at your supply chain because that's the, a market that's called a factor market. You depend on that. You depend on those people, which depends on the education they're getting. You depend on the technology that underlies all your production processes and distribution processes and communication processes. And if you want to track that stuff, you can see things coming. And I'll tell you, there's a, I'll give you a cautionary tale. There was a company that we did some work for many, many years ago. They were, uh, without telling you in too much detail what they did, their model depended on direct mail. They had validated that model for 30 years. They were the leader in their industry when it came to this. And then Hurricane Katrina happened. And there was a sudden increase in the price of fuel. And that completely destroyed their entire model. They were unprofitable and they no longer exist. They had been watching declining profit rates, which is part of just being in any one industry for a long period of time. The product life cycle is real. Eventually, your product dies. That's part of what was happening, but they weren't actually paying attention to just how dependent on their cost side, from a cost accounting standpoint, something like fuel, because their main channel mix was direct mail, and how close their margins were that any shock to that system could be a complete threat to the model. They might have had time. If they'd seen that coming by five years, they might have had time to diversify, to start to experiment with digital channels, start to experiment with email. But it just caught them totally off guard. Now, that's not really your responsibility in sales, but it's another place that when it comes to companies, it's not just you and your competitors. There's all the people who supply you. And then you got to make the argument that government jumps in here. Sometimes this chart shows the government in between everything, just messing things up. But within behavioral economics, those representative agents, when you would build these computer simulations, you'd have to have an agent. You'd have to say, people are going to behave in this way. This is really good jargon for communicating with your data scientists if you have them at your company. They understand this idea of model parameters and agents or users. The point is that your customer base, whoever it is that you're servicing as a salesperson, they are not totally uniform individuals. They are predictable as a group, but they're also within that group predictably different. And this is where personas and marketing has done a really good job, more, more so than any other group in the organization, but followed by product managers who are rapidly catching up. Because with product managers, they figured out long ago, you're going to get tons and tons of people who ask for changes to the product, and you've got to figure out who to listen to and who to not listen to because you don't have enough time to do every single thing. You have to prioritize them. With marketing, it was more about the messaging and the channel mix. But within any population, you're going to have all of these many, many different ways to divide them up. You could just look at gender, age, demographics, basically, which is how most people do this. They just do cross tabs on gender and age and household income and ethnicity and higher education status. And that's not very predictable. You will see targetable groups. Some stuff might pop out, but if you really want to understand them, it should be on that preference level about their product preferences, their pricing sensitivity, their marketing messaging. Whatever data you want to use, there is an incredible method called clustering. We're going to talk about it a lot at the next lecture. 
that you can use for creating these different personas or finding these personas. You're not really creating them. This can be done on observational data, so how they use an app, what kind of social channel they came in from with their marketing, all the stuff that's in your CRM that you know about them, the tier that they are in your customer type, the industry that they come from. You can throw in any of that information that's already there and known about them and you can cluster into groups. The other approach is that you can use surveys and this is where a quantitative survey is justified. You can go survey hundreds or thousands of customers and you can map all of those survey responses to the observational data you have as well and build really, really complex profiles. And the purpose of this is to find subgroups. Ideally, eventually, you'd want to know every single customer completely individually. And there are some AI tools, by the way, that do this for sales teams. So if you haven't heard about Crystal or you haven't heard about Charlie, those are AI automated solutions that integrate with your email and they and your calendar, and so if you have a meeting with someone, they'll go look them up and find publicly information, basically trying to automate some of that secondary research we talked about earlier. Crystal goes a step further and says, oh, this is how you should communicate with them and the kinds of things you should talk about, because we know them at a deeper level. That technology is moving in that direction where you will eventually understand individuals. It's a huge gain to just go from the average to these personas, because there's something called the Pareto Principle. This is a well-established fact from economics. It's shown up in nature. If you go look at that link in the bottom left about the Pareto Principle, it will talk about how this is observed in ant colonies. There's something called the lazy ant study. 80% of ants do not do most of the work. 20% of the ants do 80% of the actual outcome in the hives. 80% of pea pods only produce 20% of the actual peas. So conversely, 20% of the pea pods are producing 80% of the peas, which is how this economist in the 1800s actually observed this. This distribution shows up everywhere. It shows up in nonprofit donations. It shows up in AdWords clicks. 20% of your campaigns will produce 80% of your AdWords leads. So when you're talking to your marketing team about the, the leads that they're giving you, you should understand that there is a subsection of the campaigns that are working to get you these, the majority of these leads. Which ones are they? The Pareto Principle shows up over and over and over, and it's really important for customer lifetime value because when you're going through the sales process, you're that tipping point moment where they become a customer, 20% of the customers for your organization are going to ultimately generate 80% of the lifetime value. So understanding, again, how to pitch to them, how to, how to optimize your cadence and messaging outreach to them, how to qualify at the beginning to talk to them first should be the purpose of this data and the personas get you one step closer because mathematically if you use clustering they're built on the idea that whatever variables you're pouring into this model whatever dimensions you're going to use the groups that pop out are as similar to each other as possible while simultaneously being as dissimilar to everybody else that's the basic way that this works and so because of that you find really predictable subgroups and you can prioritize them around things like customer lifetime value or which channel they're coming from. And you can move away from guiding by the averages. The average is one of the worst things to guide by, especially if you're not looking at not only the average, but its interval of estimation. So you're looking at the shape and the spread and looking for things like bimodality. So maybe it's a lot of really poor experiences and a lot of really positive experiences that sort of water out against each other into a me, sort of middle meh experience and yet it masks these very bipolar experiences that are going on. You have to be very careful with averages. Personas move you a very powerful step beyond that. But even within them you don't want to just look at their averages. And then what about game theory? I said I'd come back to this. I, if you're really, really savvy, there is a wonderful series that is available on YouTube. I, I think it's MIT Open Course. It might be Yale Open Course. Just look for the words Open Course Game Theory Class. And there's a camera in a classroom recorded the entire semester, game theory lectures. This is worth your time. Salespeople are competitive by nature, and this is the quantification and analysis of that process. Game theory is a lot of fun. It, it can be complicated, it can make your brain melt sometimes, but it is, it's really fun, and it's really powerful. And if you go out and get competitive intelligence, so during the secondary process, you can go find what customers of your competitors have said, 
You can go read their app reviews, just like you can read yours. You can go read their Google reviews. You can go read anything that's in the public domain about your competitors. All of that information that you can get legally. I'm not talking about corporate espionage here. Everything that you can get legally about your competitors is competitive intelligence. And here's how to know if you've crossed the line. If you feel bad inside, you got something that was so proprietary, might have been public, but it was still so proprietary that you know that they wouldn't be happy if you had it and you don't feel good about yourself, that you've crossed the line. Short of that, if it's legally available, if it's out there in the public domain, it's, it's open game. Use it, because if you have that information, you can start to use game theory, and the best use case for game theory are called best response curves. So discrete choice modeling, which I've talked about in some of our other lectures, which can tell you the exact levels of product and preference, product preference and pricing sensitivity, from that, you can create demand curves. And with your demand curves, which are just built largely on ideas of quantity and price, and maybe information that you got publicly, so if your competitor is a publicly traded company, you can get this stuff from their quarterly reports. They will tell you exactly how much they have sold and at what, what amount. You can start to figure out their demand curves over time, and then you can create something called best response curves, so where you move beyond your own decision making. Look, we're going to do X, Y, and Z to now we're going to do X, Y, and Z in response to our competitors doing A, B, and C. And if they do A, we do X. If they do B, we do Y. Because that's our best response. It's going to ensure the most market share. It's going to ensure the most revenue. It's going to ensure the most profit. You can build those models with a lot of the competitive intelligence that's just openly available about competitors, especially if they're a publicly traded company. Government makes them put everything out there. So let's recap before we go into the Q&A. We've already got a couple questions I saw that came in through the chat. We talked about the power of market research. This is not a boring field. It's something that can provide access to information you could not otherwise get, and that information is incredibly powerful. Whether you do it from a secondary research standpoint, you do qualitative interviews, you do quantitative research. It's powerful. It's something you should be using especially for sales. Because the act of secondary research and qualitative interviews is not hard for you to do. You're already doing a lot of it. You need to start quantifying it. There's stuff you can and should hand off to third parties. There's stuff you will have to do yourself and it's going to change some of your internal processes. Start small, but begin these interviews. And I ended with some examples of behavioral data, and I know, I think one of the questions it looks like is about how to use this behavioral data, how to do the game theory. Maybe you don't have the time to put in to watch all those YouTube videos, nor the interest. But hire an economist. Google did it. Hal Varian, the man who built their AdWords platform, is an economist. I use his textbook when I teach microeconomics. He built the AdWords platform. That was 80% of Google's 100 billion last year, so they have a pretty good ROI on that guy. Behavioral data is very powerful. With that, let's open up into questions and then we can end and talk about what's coming up in the next lecture. Here we go. Where in the qualitative research process do most people struggle when implementing it for the first time? Planning. By, by far the number one thing, and we've said this many times in the lecture. In fact, any of the lectures that we've linked to today probably link back to uh, the very the first lecture in this series, which was creating a data culture, and then the second or third, which was about getting a quick data wins. Those two lectures will lay out the planning process, how you have to do it. The different kinds of data scientists, you need to understand, there's different kinds of data people and third parties that are going to have different levels of skill. You're going to have to understand a little bit about this before you start purchasing. You're not going to be a savvy, savvy customer. Um, but even beyond that, the SMART goals, and that's what is in the getting a quick data wins lecture. The SMART goals is the most important step in any of this process. So the Agile product, um, the Agile research for product managers lecture that I know we linked to in one of the footnotes here, um, it addresses that process of like the SMART goals and how you get, why you have to do that first. 
But that's where most people get, go wrong. It's, okay, we're going to start interviewing customers. Well, why? What are you going to ask them? At which of these sales stages are you going to do these different questions? Why? And then how is that information going to be used? That's one of the most effective pieces of the SMART goals is not just getting people to list what they want to know, but how they're going to use it. Because if you don't know how you're going to use it, then there's no reason producing it. It takes a lot of time to do qualitative interviews, even more time to do quantitative interviews. To go get good data answers takes some time. You better know how you're going to use the information. It also helps ensure that the information that's collected is useful. Cool. Uh, we have another question. Any guesses? Any guesses on how long it will take for the data wave to die down and for it to become normalized? Uh, I'm going to assume that by the term normalized, you mean that uh, it's like typing. I've made this argument in other places that data is the next mandatory skill set in the business world. If you're in your 40s, you might be able to get through the rest of your career without having to learn this. But it's a gamble, no guarantees. If you are under 40 and you're not paying attention to data analytics in your career, it's going to be like you not being able to type in the 90s. It's so like in the 80s, you just decided to not learn to type. It's going to put you at such a disadvantage to the baseline that you will suddenly find yourself in last place. So when I say, when I'm assuming what you mean by normalization, that's the world of like everybody just knows it. I would say five years maybe 10 because it has to happen through academia and it, academia moves kind of slow on this stuff. Stats and data analytics is one of the poor taught disciplines in all of higher education right now and that's in part because of the history of how it evolved from statistics but also because so much of this stuff is new. There's people who are writing packages for R that do stuff for the first time ever right now. Probably a dozen of them came out today. It'll be years before that stuff's in a textbook and it's being taught to students It'll be years before those students then bring it to the workforce and normalize it. So I would expect that the data wave is going to die down probably in the next five years from a market hype standpoint. Because the other thing is businesses are adopting this. They are moving through the data governance stages now. They're, they're hiring chief data officers. That's a good sign that the organization is serious about data. Um, they've got, in some cases, chief chief AI or chief analytics officers who are now in charge of making sure all insights are being produced for the organization. And by the way, this is where sales teams, you're the furthest behind within the organization when it comes to data, and it's the most useful to your stage compared to anything else, because all anybody else in the organization cares about is revenue, that they have the money to keep marketing, that they have the money to keep building the product, that they have the money to keep servicing the clients, that they have the profit that comes from the sales. And this is because you as sales individuals have not demanded from your company the same level of investment in data that is seen in product and in marketing. And ops is now starting to invest a lot in data as well. It used to just be IT, right? It's a cost center. Then it was call centers tied to customer service were cost centers. Then they realized those could be profit generating centers. Data was the next one. And sales departments have not demanded the support that's available to other groups in the enterprise. So, long story short, five years, ten at the absolute most. Tom, it seemed like you had a question. Uh, it's really a comment. Um, okay. Uh, I saw a thing online that said, you know, Facebook is selling the data, uh, but you can check what they're selling about you. So I went and it looks like they think I'm African American and English speaking. And <laughs> okay. an English speaking. For those who are in the room, that does not describe Tom. That would not be an accurate description. And it is true. You can go check the profiles that a lot of these companies have built on you. The one who's built the the most is Experian. So Experian has crazy amounts of information on people that they're getting from these giant public sources. And you can buy a lot of that information. Same with Facebook. You can buy that information for the purposes of targeted marketing. Something has happened with Facebook marketing in the last six months. So between last August and November, we were running ads and the performance levels were astonishing. Truly astonishing. Super targeted. We're like, we need a cryptocurrency interested person in Russia. And we found them within two hours of posting an ad for research. And then in November, something happened and nothing performed anymore. We couldn't reach anybody. Like we would run ads that had 
hundreds of thousands of people reached and no one clicked it, no one participated in the research. We're running these ads for the purposes of finding research participants, but suddenly it just changed. And we started pushing on them and we got the runaround on the customer service, the worst, some of the worst customer service I've ever experienced. Um, and then their solution was, we'll give you a code for more ads that won't perform. Sure enough, they didn't, and the code didn't work anyway. So then they charged us and we had to tell them that they hadn't, and they're like, well, we'll give you the code again. It's like, well, yeah, you were supposed to do that before. And I don't, I don't know what's going on over there. The Cambridge Analytica stuff is not really sold. You did that to yourself. If you were one of the people that got profiled, you did it to yourself. You wanted to know what Avenger character you were from a survey. You did. It was important to you. Which Gilmore girl you were from a survey. You can go look at my Facebook profile from three years ago, and I predicted this. I said, just so everybody knows, because I understood the terms and conditions of Facebook, when you're giving these third-party surveys access to your profile, you're giving away all your information and all of your network's information. Okay, well, I said earlier in this, if you want the code that will let you do that right now today with Twitter, which is even more open than Facebook and you don't even have to pay for it, just send me an email after this and I will send you the R code. You'll have to swap the tokens. You can be up and running in 90 minutes, scraping data from Twitter, getting individuals, finding out who they were, who they are, possible leads, their whole networks. You're giving this information away. And I actually believe it's going to create a better world. I think this fear of like, oh, they profiled you. They only profiled people and then did something negative because they also knew from a behavioral economic standpoint that you were more likely to engage with something negative than you were something positive, at least in that domain. And so they made the decision to use the profiling to promote negativity rather than sort of positivity. And we got a whole bunch of really bad outcomes. That's a possible outcome. That's a possible path for the future. It's going to be so far outweighed by all the positives of, look, as a salesperson, you only want to talk to people who are going to want your product anyways. You don't want to waste your time with people who are kicking tires or don't understand who you are. That's the whole purpose of a qualification stage. And customers want products. If you have the best solution to their problem, they want it. They'll pay for it. And all that data could allow, if they could profile you correctly, which they can't, it could allow for a better matchup of that. That's really the promise in economics of it. But if you want to see an example of how we're going to do that with data, this next lecture is a good one, creating data-driven customer profiles. Thursday, April 12th, it'll be another hour-long lecture. You can sign up in the same lecture page in paratos.com forward slash lecture. It'll be up Monday. We will post the video from today on our YouTube page. For those who joined us remotely, thank you. We'll see you at the next one. And for those who are in the room, as always, it's great to see you.